This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White. I am your host today, and I'm happy to be uh, here after uh, somewhat of an absence. Glad to represent the Mississippi Arts Commission. And I'm here with producer Kevin Farrell, longtime producer of the Mississippi Arts Hour. And I wanted to remind Kevin, I'm sure he doesn't keep up quite like I do, that today marks the 16th anniversary of the Mississippi Arts Hour. We spent uh, three years from 2005, 2008 uh, at a community radio station here in Jackson, WLEZ. And we moved over to MPB in 2008 and we remain here today and are very happy uh, to be celebrating a 16 year anniversary uh, as the Mississippi Arts Hour. Today on the show, I have two amazing guests. First, Ellen Daniels, the new executive director of the Mississippi Book Festival and Ralph Eubanks, a writer, speaker, professor, and a real raconteur and friend to all things books in Mississippi. Ellen, who, as I said, is the new executive director of the Mississippi Book Festival, received her first camera. It was a hot pink and lime green Polaroid cool cam at the age of seven. She recalls using the camera to photograph her toys. She was reprimanded by her parents for trying to sell these photographs to her friends at school. She majored in fine arts at Belhaven University with a concentration in photography. The Rolling Fork native brings a curious mind and a keen eye to the task as executive director. This is home (laughs) after two and a half years as the book festival's literary director and a dozen years as a bookseller at Lemuria. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you, Malcolm, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me on here today. Absolutely. And I'll remind you that you and I participated in a book called Studio Jackson some years ago, where uh, Nell Knox and you produced this wonderful book about the creative culture in the Mississippi capital, and I was honored to write the forward. So this is your first book, and hopefully there will be more. Well, you, uh, you did a wonderful job uh, writing the introduction of that book. And I would like to say in the beginning part of, of what you said about me with my cool cam, my Polaroid cool cam, those sell for a whopping $500 now on eBay. I, I would give oh. anything to still have that camera. I was about to ask if you kept it. Uh, my mother is not a keeper of things. She likes to shuffle things out. She would clear things out while I was away at school, but she never cleared away the books. And for that, I am grateful. However, your father is a keeper of things, and I'm surprised he didn't keep the cool cam. Well, you know, he had to work, so he was not privy to things that were being moved out. (laughs) (laughs) But you have been the beneficiary of some of those things. That is correct. Our home has some of those very things that your father has kept and passed on to his friends. Our second guest is Ralph Eubanks, and Ralph is a native of Mount Olive, Mississippi. He's a Piney Woods guy. He is the author of Ever is a Long Time and The House at the End of the Road. He has written for the Chicago Tribune, Vanity Fair, Time, The Wall Street Journal, Wired, The New Yorker, and National Public Radio. He is a past recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, was a fellow at the New America Foundation and the former editor of the Virginia Quarterly Review at the University of Virginia, where Mr. Faulkner attended for a short while and I think was a visiting professor there, if I'm not mistaken. He is also on the staff, but is on leave as a professor of English and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. And Ralph, I believe that you have a new assignment to share with us today. Yes, I am the Carl and Lily Forsheimer Foundation Fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. So I'm spending a year 
here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right down the street from the Quentin Compson Bridge, um, writing a book on the Mississippi Delta. One of the oh. strange experiences of my life is writing about the Delta here in the great Northeast. Wow. Well, and your most recent book, A Place Like Mississippi, um, a journey through a real and imagined literary landscape uh, is a book that really ties together uh, the Mississippi literary traditions, the book festival and the Mississippi Writers Trail, all of which the three of us in some way or another represent today. So congratulations on the newest book. And if you wouldn't mind, sort of tell us, are you still traveling and promoting that book or have you wrapped that up to move on? I am still traveling and promoting that book. I'm actually coming to Columbus, Mississippi on the 21st for the um, Eudora Welty um, Writers Conference oh. at the Mississippi University for Women. Perfect, perfect. Well, congratulations uh, on all of that. And uh, to both of you, to Ellen, for becoming the new executive director of our Mississippi Book Festival, and Ralph, to you for your new assignment at Harvard, and also uh, for the new book, A Place Like Mississippi. So Ellen, you uh, have been on the job very for a very short while as the new ED. Tell us what's going on with our Mississippi Book Festival. So as you all know, we had to cancel our in-person event in August, which we were very sad to do, but we saw no other way around it. But we had such an incredible response from over 100 authors and moderators who were still willing to participate virtually. And we, you know, worked for, you know, a month and a half to get a lot of the panels that would have happened at the festival recorded and available to our ever-growing book festival audience, which is now on our website. Um, there's been some incredible panels. For instance, Ralph was on a wonderful panel titled The Southern Literary Landscape, where, which John T. Edge moderated with Ralph, Larry Wells, and Michael Gora. So it's all about as what we were just talking about, the Southern literary tradition, which Ralph's book so wonderfully gives us, you know, a very thorough snapshot of. And, you know, Larry Wells, who's from Oxford, who has been on the Arts Hour with you, Malcolm, talking yes, about yes. his memoir in, the, uh, in Faulkner's Shadow. And then Michael Gora, The Saddest Words, uh, William Faulkner's Civil War. So, and there's other things. We have um, Kiese Lehman in conversation with uh, Jared Woods of a Black Man Reading Instagram account, talking about revision and uh, the re-release of Kiese's um, First books, uh, How to Slowly Kill Yourself in America, Essays and Long Division. We've got a wonderful uh, essay panel, which is moderated by our beloved Beth Ann Finley with uh, Amy Mazuka Matatil and Helen Ellis and Lauren Poe. Um, there, there's 31 panels for you to choose from, and there's a, it's a diverse slate of panels which would uh, appeal to all readers taste. So we hope that uh, everyone has been enjoying those. And if you haven't listened to, watched any of them yet that you do, you can also listen to them as a podcast on the Mississippi Book Festival's podcast, Right on Mississippi, which is produced by MPV. So this is uh, the second year that you've had to go virtual, correct? It is indeed. Um, you know, as we were all discussing before we started this conversation, we've learned a lot through COVID. Um, you know, virtual is very helpful in a lot of ways. For instance, um, you know, the Mississippi Book Festival always has a kids event the Friday before the actual festival. Right. And in past years, we've bust in, you know, thousands of children to Folly Mara or Galloway. But this year, we decided to do it virtually and make it truly statewide. And we had Nick Stone, who is our own beloved Angie Thomas's best friend. Uh, Nick lives in Atlanta, and she... Um, came with her newest middle grade book, Clean Getaway, which is about a young boy and his grandmother going on a road trip and hitting famous civil rights sites. They come here to Jackson and they see Medgar's house. Um, it's a wonderful book. And we touched 9,300 children that day across the state of Mississippi. Uh, Nick was in conversation with, with them. And, um, 
you know, getting the comments back from teachers after that, from all those children seeing Nick and listening to listening to her story about how she wrote the book. And you know, just she was very it was a very inspiring talk about, you know, just keep on writing, you know, do what brings you joy. And then we donated five books to each library that participated um, in that event. And we had 55 schools participate that day. So again, virtual is great in some ways because Correct. some children were able to participate that otherwise wouldn't have. Now, Ralph, I know that you've participated live and in person uh, in past book festivals and you now have participated virtually. Can you talk to us a little bit about those experiences? What has been uh, interesting about the, the virtual side of it is that, at least for me this year, there's someone that I've been doing virtual panels with, Michael Gora, that I've never met. And Michael is often in Cambridge. So we've actually met in person. That's been the great thing, I think, about these virtual panels. They're people that you get to know. Uh, and then eventually you do meet them. And what's really gratifying about that is that you actually find that the connection you made online is a real one. And that's what we always worry about is that these virtual connections are just the disembodied version of the, the other person. But a lot of that person really comes through. Right. And, and again, you've also participated and, and been at some of the past uh, book festivals live. Talk a little bit about the book festival and what it means to a writer to, to come back home and to have this amazing uh, book festival there uh, to participate in and where you don't have to go to New York or Texas or California uh, to gather with your tribe. Well, it's wonderful because I think people really want to come to Mississippi for the book festival because there's, it's such a wide array of, of folks and it is kind of getting together with with your tribe of, of writers. And that's what's really wonderful about it. And the connections that you make there are really lasting. They're people that, that I've met through the book festival that I don't think I would probably meet otherwise. And people who find that Mississippi is, may come to Mississippi somewhat reluctantly, but then come to Mississippi and fall in love with the place. And that's what's even better. So I've often been, you know, kind of the designated person taking folks around to the sites that I think that they should see while they're in Jackson. The cultural and literary, uh, I guess you would say, ambassador for Mississippi. I, I try to take on that role as best I can. <laughs> you do a wonderful job, Ralph. Absolutely. The title of your latest book, A Place Like Mississippi, uh, I love this because I know that it comes from a quote attributed to William Faulkner, but basically through Willie Morris. And it always makes me laugh. And I always think Willie is just having a belly roll of a laugh uh, in literary heaven <laughs> to know that you have used this title for, for something that he was up to. I always say that, that the title of the book is Willie Morris prank calling us from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's interesting that when I used that phrase and Ted Atkinson at Mississippi State was one of the readers of the text of my book, I didn't know that this was not something that Faulkner had said. And Ted caught it and then I started researching it and I called Joanne Morris to talk with her about that. And strange Mississippi connections when I was teaching at Millsaps as a Eudora Welty fellow. Um, Joanne was my landlady. So I said, <laughs> Joanne, um, and she said, yeah, you know, Willie just thought that Faulkner should have said that. So that's a, it's, it's a great line and it's, and it's kind of been a good calling card for me to, to say, yeah, it's, it's not something Faulkner said, it's just, it's Willie being Willie. Uh, I've actually seen posters uh, with, to understand the world, you have to understand a place like Mississippi, William Faulkner underneath it. It's, it's amazing. Willie would love this. And, <laughs> and, and, and I love it. It's a fantastic book. And I recommend anyone tuned in uh, to give it a read. You will be glad that you did.
Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White. I'm your host today, sitting in for my great friends at the Mississippi Arts Commission, where I spent a few days uh, with those good folks. My guests today are Ellen Daniels, the new executive director of our great Mississippi Book Festival, and our friend Ralph Eubanks, who joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he is a uh, fellow at Harvard University. There are more specifics if you wish to uh, dig in or ask Ralph about that. But welcome back to both of you. We're so happy that you're here. It's good to be here. Thank you, Malcolm. So Ellen, uh, we were talking about the festival uh, being remote this year as well as last year, but you know, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about next year and tell us about the plans for the 2022 Mississippi Book Festival. Well, we're in the beginning stages of planning 2022, and we are excited to be able to have another literary lawn party, which is the party line for the Mississippi Book Festival. It's a literary lawn party that takes place on the State Capitol Complex lawn. Um, We had a literary log on party this year, so um, we are excited about being back together in person in 2022. And we've got a couple things, you know, kind of in the works. I think it's a little too early to reveal those. You know, we have to keep okay. you can tease it. <laughs> anticipating something great to happen. But I think the most important thing is all of us being able to be back together um, and celebrating our love of books and their authors. Um, you know, I heard in one of our virtual panels this year, Helen Ellis, who is originally from Alabama, who is a riot, and she is a three-time Mississippi Book Festival panelist. I think Ralph is probably a next time Mississippi Book Festival panelist. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. But Helen was talking about being from the South, storytelling is competitive sport. And right. that rang so true and accurate. While it was hilarious, it's so true. And, you know, as Ralph was saying before, um, you know, a lot of people want to come to Mississippi and they have a certain expectation in their mind. And I think once they get here and they come to this festival, Um, everything, all their preconceived notions are kind of thrown out the window because if there is anything that Mississippians hold dear, that is a good story and the people who tell those good stories. So that's what we like to celebrate with the Mississippi Book Festival. And do we know the dates for 2022 yet? We we are the uh, third Saturday in August every summer and we will be all together again on August 20th, 2022. Back at the Mississippi uh, state capital, capital. state yeah. grounds. Yeah. 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 I, I always like to refer to Mississippi as 2.9 million storytellers. Um, <laughs> and, and I like to talk about uh, what you alluded to with uh, how people want to come to Mississippi, this, that, and you know, I call it the curiosity factor. Yeah. Uh, and, and while we may have some demons and we may have a tattered path past, uh, people are very curious about this place called Mississippi. And Ralph, you, I guess, are many times the voice in the face of Mississippi as you travel around this great globe of ours, uh, being a native son. Yes, it is. Uh, Well, yes, and and, um, I am actually giving a a talk here at Harvard on February 15th on why the Mississippi Delta matters. So really talking about Mississippi 
why it matters, and also doing that as part of our storytelling tradition. And that's the, the great thing. And the other thing I people say, well, aren't people just a, a little bit crazy down in Mississippi? <laughs> yeah, I said, but we bring our crazy people and put them on the front porch and let us let them tell the stories. <laughs> so we don't we don't hide them in the back or up in the attic. So uh, and I think that kind of piques their interest and in, and in say, you know, I've said to many of my fellows who have never been to Mississippi, well, you all come see us now. Right. Yeah, my friend David Patterson likes to say, you know, I don't put my stuff on the back porch. I put everything on the front porch. And I think that's how Mississippi rolls. That's exactly it. That is exactly how we roll. And, and I do represent that in a lot of ways while I'm here in Cambridge. I, it's, you know, it's very difficult to distance yourself from Mississippi when you're writing about it. I think you have to, I have to find ways to put myself there, which is why every day I walk across the Anderson Memorial Bridge because wow. that's, I feel this closeness to this place that it's part of a tragic event and, you know, Faulkner's novel, but it really connects me to, to Mississippi. And Ellen, you uh, as the executive director are now uh, the face um, and the uh, voice of the, the Mississippi Book Festival. You must uh, have some pretty highfalutin uh, silk leg meetings uh, with these uh, book houses, whether they are on the East Coast or West Coast. What's it like calling on, you know, the big publishing houses and wooing uh, the big names in the literary world to invite them to come to our Mississippi? Well, Malcolm, so the Mississippi Book Festival has incredible relationships that have been built up over the years, um, you know, with the five big publishing houses in New York and then, you know, smaller presses, which we also love and we highlight a small indie press every year at the Book Festival. And the way we've been able to build that relationship up is by putting on an incredible event that authors want to come to. Um, you know, when I started working for the book festival in 2019, I, you know, I kept hearing, you know, inside the office about the magic, the magic, the magic. And being able to, you know, take part in planning and see it all come into fruition on that day in August, I got, I understood the magic. You know, people, there's a whole committee of people that labor over these panels that you know, make it to the Mississippi Book Festival. We start out with a very long list and it gets edited and edited and edited. And we just, we pick the cream that rises to the top. And, you know, in 2021, it was difficult to plan a book festival because all the big publishers were really trying to protect themselves because of COVID, which I completely understand. And they really weren't um, passing along a lot of the invitations. And so I have really um, created a relationship with a couple of authors and one of them in New York just started sending me people's email addresses. They were like, email them, they want to come, email them, they want to come. And, and they did. And that was really kind of incredible to watch happen and be a part of. Um, so, you know, this it's been a long process of building those relationships, which I wasn't here for a lot of it, but the people that created the Mississippi Book Festival um, did a wonderful job in creating a foundation for growth um, with this event in our state. Yeah, and I think we should, uh, you know, have a tip of the hat uh, to some of those uh, sure. people who paved the way. Holly Lang, the previous executive director, uh, did a magnificent job. And certainly Jerry Nash, who has, I don't know what his official title is, but serving on the board, Jerry Nash has uh, obviously puts in a lot of time, effort, and has devoted a major part of his life uh, to, to, to this event. Um, there are no... There are no two people on the planet like Jerry Nash and Holly Lang. Um, the amount of things that Holly can do, I will never be able to wrap my mind around. There's nothing that that woman can't do. And Jerry is probably the most attentive board president I've ever, I've ever heard of. Um, we have a new deputy director named Jordan Perry. And Jordan, um, a few days onto the job, and she was like, I've never seen a board president this involved. He's incredible. <laughs> I mean, and I just, you know, we just adore him. Um, and y'all all know Jerry and know that he is a force to be reckoned with. Um, That's for sure. 
<laughs> He's a smart cookie, though. Nothing yeah, gets by, Jerry. That he is. So, Ralph, uh, I, I have talked a little bit about uh, your most recent book, A Place Like Mississippi. Tell us about what you're working on now. What's next? I know as a uh, as a writer who gets up every day writing and probably goes to bed every night making notes about what to write tomorrow, there's got to be a new project in the works. Well, yes, I am working on a book on the Mississippi Delta. And here in my office at Harvard, I have kind of what it is that I'm, I'm doing and say, what are the policy, political, and cultural choices that have disadvantaged the people of the Mississippi Delta? And how have the myths of the Delta as a place obscured its realities? So those are the two big questions that I've been kind of confronting. I have two research partners who are working with me, one of them from South Haven, Mississippi, the other one from Washington, DC. So connections in both places, you know, Washington DC is my uh, adopted home city. So um, they are really digging into this project. They love working on it. And because my research partner from South Haven has family roots in the Delta, she is completely into this project and has been doing some amazing work for me. Now you were looking up as you were talking about those <laughs> Uh, topics. Have, have you taken to writing on the wall like Faulkner there in your office at Harvard? I, I have. I have a big whiteboard here. <laughs> and what I, I do is I, you know, the, as, as what I'm focusing on at the moment goes up on that whiteboard. And then when my research partners come here, like they're, they're coming here later today, and I've just done a new outline of the project and how I think the research is going to flow from, from here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna put that up on the whiteboard, but I, I have that up on the board. So when I walk in every day, I know what it is that I need to be focusing on. Um, you know, what are the two big questions? And there's room on that board for a couple of more questions to explore as well. Uh, and that's, that's it's, it's a real gift to be able to, focus on a project for an entire year without teaching responsibilities. All I have to do is get up every day and research and write. Wow. Yeah, what a, what, what a gift. Yeah. But so. uh, no better gift could be given to a man uh, who has more potential and who is better deserving of such than you. Do you have a working title for the new piece? Uh, the working title right now is When It's Darkness on the Delta. That's, uh -huh. that's, that's my working title because that's a song that I think in a lot of ways embraces the mythology of the Delta. Yeah. And it wasn't even written by someone from the Delta, which is how very, curious. <laughs> very often we project an idea of a place on it from people outside of the region. And that's, that's why I'm, that's my working title. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Wine. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White today as your host with the wonderful guest in the studio from the Mississippi Book Festival, Ellen Daniels, the new executive director, and our great writer, friend, and uh, cultural ambassador and literary ambassador for the state of Mississippi, Ralph Eubanks. Welcome back, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ellen, before you became the executive director of the Mississippi Book 
festival, you were a bookseller. You spent some 12 or so years at Lemuria. Did you sell many of Ralph's books? I did. I, I've, I've sold uh, an uncountable number of ever is a very long time. And um, I think that in so, somewhere it's required reading. And I remember the same time every year, the same age group of kids would come in to buy that book. So, I mean, they would ask me where it is and I could just take them straight to it. We <laughs> always have a lot of copies of that on hand. And Ralph, the new project that you have shared with us uh, is, is a book about the Delta. And as you know, Ellen Daniels here is from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Yeah. Could be no more Delta gal than that. I'd like to see the two of you talk a little bit about the Delta and uh, sort of the way you're approaching it uh, as a scholar, Ralph and, and Ellen, the way that you see the Delta uh, from your upbringing and your childhood and your history. Oh, I, I would say that I think that Ellen will probably like this. I'm, I'm really beginning this book thinking about a photograph, um, a photograph that Marion Post Wolcott took in Milestone, Mississippi in the 1930s. And one of the things that I've chased down is some correspondence that she had with Roy Stryker at the Farm Security Administration, where she, he is complimenting her on her impressive photographs of this um, prosperous Negro community. And that's where my uh, father moved in 1949. You know, Milestone was a resettlement uh, mm -hmm. project, part of the resettlement project for the Farm Security Administration. And they built 100 houses there for former sharecroppers, bought 110,000 acres of land and subdivided it to black farmers. So that's really where I'm beginning is in Milestone in Holmes County. And um, that is today the largest segment of black owned land in the Mississippi Delta. And I often think had there been more milestones, would be we be looking at a different delta today? Mm. And, and I think that's that's where I'm really beginning this book is looking at the history of milestone and also nearby Providence Farm, um, which was this very radical. Um, I say it's a radical Christian integrationist farm cooperative <laughs> in, wow. in in um, Holmes County, and thinking about how the Delta is a radical space in a lot of ways, uh, and also the beauty of the Delta. So not, not, just, the, not just the pain of the place, but, but the beauty. And I think thinking about how in some ways we have really, um, how we've neglected, I think, this, this very important part of Mississippi's cultural heritage. Wow. And this, uh, the book is a, a continuation of, of a piece you, you wrote. Was it for the Oxford American? Yes, it was for the Oxford American. That piece was called The Deming Mystique of Milestone. And uh, Milestone was this, when my father went there, it was something when he left Tuskegee in 1949. He went there and, and he felt a great deal of promise for this place. And uh, and by 1956, in the wake of the Emmett Till murder, as well as the dissolution of Providence Farm and all the turmoil that came up and racial violence came up as a result of that, my family left the Delta. Wow. So I've always, um, I was always taken back there. I know my father never wanted to leave. So I have, since I've been back in Mississippi, you know, I've been back in Mississippi since 2016. So for the last you know, five years, I spend a lot of time in the Delta. I spend time there. It's like spending time with my parents. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I spend more time in Milestone than I do at my parents' graves. So. Great. And well, Ellen, um, uh, a, na a yeah. native of that soil? Yeah. Well, you know, the Delta is such a mythologized place and almost kind of fetishized a little bit. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and at, there is no other place like it on earth. My entire family still lives there and I love to go visit it. Um, you know, I go all the time. 
and growing up, you know, it was all I knew. So I didn't think anything of it. You know, that was, that was just what I knew. We lived in this small little rural uh, community in the South Delta. And the South Delta is very different from the North Delta, as I was told from a man from Clarksdale. When he asked me where I was from, I said, I'm from Rollinport. He was like, oh, my, you people from the South Delta are barely domesticated. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. So thank you. Um, that's not exactly what I've I never said. thought of you as being domesticated. <laughs> not exactly what I told him, but I won't say it on air. Um, you know, the Delta is such an incredibly beautiful landscape. And as far as dirt goes, it doesn't get much better than the dirt in the Mississippi Delta. But, um, you know, there it, it also has a very troubled past, and a lot of that has carried over into our present. You know, there is little to no uh, middle class. Um, you know, there is wealth or extreme poverty in most situations. And um, I would love for people to see the beauty that it has, but also the problems which uh, therein lie and how we can uh, rectify those problems. You know, education is not great in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, my sister does a lot of work with education in um, our small town of Rolling Fork. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of resources that, you know, places like Jackson and Oxford and, you know, kind of more uh, metropolitan areas have. I don't think anyone's ever referred to Oxford as metropolitan, but it has a very good education system there. Right. Um, you know, I would, being somebody from the Delta and loving it as much as I do, I would love for that uh, bridge, that gap to be bridged. Um, and I know that and you have seen that as well, Ralph, in all of your time in the Delta um, being so connected to it. I Indeed I have. And, and that is one of the things that I want to explore is I've, I have um, said to people here at Harvard, I'm not a policy person, but what I want this book to do is to evoke the questions of policy that we should be thinking about, not just with the Delta, but with the whole um, system of income inequality that has come up in, in this country. The Delta is simply a microcosm of the issue of income inequality in this country. We like to project the mythology on the Delta and say these are self-inflicted problems that the, the people of the Delta have rendered on themselves. But what I found is I dig into the archives and look at these stories that people tell me that couldn't be farther from the truth. But I want to get to those questions that we should be wrestling with, with respect to not just the Delta, but the rest of rural America. Yeah. with the Rust Belt. There, there are all these places that there are lots of Mississippi Deltas around this country. Yeah. And I want to bring attention to those. And one of the, the great things about being here is I've been looking at how foundations have funded things in, in the Delta and kind of analyzing that and trying to figure out what it is I should be doing with that. And the great thing is there right across the hall from me is an economist that I'm gonna be talking with about those. Or I can head over to the Kennedy School and talk with the policy people over there. What is it you're thinking about with respect to education policy in rural America? What should that be? What should be the ideas around broadband access in a place like the Delta or anywhere in rural America? I think the, that's really what I'm trying to do with the Delta. Look at the Delta and think about how are the issues of the Delta issues that are national, not just for the Delta, but are national issues. Yeah, and it's interesting, uh, Ralph, that you are having this opportunity to look at a very serious uh, topic through the lens of art. As a, as a creative writer, uh, you know, you're able to uh, take facts and figures and documentation and studies and, and, and to render it into and through the, the, the lens of art and to put it into a book and hoping, and again, I'm not saying what you do, I'm saying the, the, the way I view what you do, offer people a creative and fascinating way to look at really tough problems. And, and Ellen, you have done this all of your life in a very similar way as a photographer. You, you've looked at this place, these places where you've lived and worked through the creative lens of photographer. 
uh, of a photographer and perhaps, you know, reveal some of the truths and the hard truths uh, that are, uh, you know, in the Delta and as you say, Ralph, and the other Deltas all across the globe. Well, you know, I, um, for so long uh, in relationship to my photography, you know, I was so used to, um, I was so used to the Delta, so I wasn't exactly creatively inspired by it for some reason. And then I went to a photo um, photography workshop outside um, in Clarksdale, outside of Clarksdale, the shack up in. And there were people from all over the country um, that came and they were just so inspired by this landscape and everything around. And being able to see the Delta through their eyes like lit this fire in me. And I was like, this is a place like no other. And it's, you know, it's my, it is my native soil. And so I was like, what am I missing? And so I really started looking at, um, you know, the Delta kind of with my adult eyes and not as like this angsty teen that was trying to get so away from it for so long. You know, I had kind of just adopted that, um, that mentality about my home. And, you know, I always wanted to move away. I wanted to move to New York City and da 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 Well, then I started becoming incredibly inspired by where I come from. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, I don't ever need to leave here. And I have a lot of dear friends that live up in New York. And they're like, when are you going to move up here? da 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 and I, and I finally was able to say, you know what? I'm never going to move up here. I'll come visit y'all. But the things that I'm inspired by, that's where, I mean, I live there now and I'm not leaving there. Right. Um, so it is a very special place. It has its problems like all places, um, but it's, you know, it's very special to me. I mean, it is in my, it is in my blood. So. And do you have photographers uh, that are your sort of, inspiration you and i've talked a lot about william eggleston in the past um you know i love william eggleston you know one of my very favorite photographers uh not a delta photographer it's clarence john laughlin from uh new orleans uh, i was very uh intrigued by you know those kind of moody surrealist photos when i was in college um sally mann is a favorite but then just think of someone who did photograph the delta heavily um Jack Spencer. I mean, the first time I ever saw native soil, I burst into tears. Um, I was so moved by those images. And then I met Jack <laughs> <laughs> and I love him so much. And he is definitely a force of nature, but, um, you know, Jack's one of a kind and to know, the, know this person and see, see these gorgeous photos <laughs> that came from this person is a pretty incredible juxtaposition. Um, but I love this one of my most favorite bodies of work ever. Um, he is an incredible artist and I love that he did that body of work in the Delta. So, and you actually got to work professionally with him when you were at Fisher Galleries, right? I did. I did. So yeah, I, I got to know Jack very, very well. I got to ride around in his car with him one day. We rode around and made photos. Um, I actually got one of my favorite expressions from Jack Spencer. Um, if I think very lowly of someone, I call them a knuckle dragon mouth breather. And he <laughs> says that all the time. <laughs> it's just the funniest thing. And I have to give him credit where credit is due whenever I say it and someone finds it particularly hysterical. I can't claim it as my own. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, you get the last word. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's been wonderful being being with you all and so wonderful, you know, hearing about Ellen's version of the Delta and that, uh, that I think hearing from a Delta person that we need to strip through the layers of myth on the place lets me know that I'm moving in the right direction. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can... Please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by 